Okay, let's begin. So sorry it took a few days. It's been a pretty busy weekend. So um, I'm going to continue with the tissue localization of palm seed. And this is in the review that's titled uh, Palm Seed, the Physiological Power of Hormone Processing. So let's begin. So there is a wealth of evidence that in a few key tissues where both the POMC gene is expressed and peptides derived from the POMC precursor proteins are released, POMC has an important and biologically meaningful role. So here we're being a little explicit. There, is, there are a few key tissues, and these tissues uh, both express the POMC gene and the peptides derived from the POMC precursor protein are released. Uh, so you make it and you are synthesizing the final active peptides and releasing those final active peptides. So not all tissues have that ability. So remember, you have DNA. Your DNA is in all of your cells, uh, or I should say most of your cells. And it's the same or generally almost the same DNA. But what is different about one cell type versus another one is that the expression of the genes is different depending on what cell type it is. And so um, there might be some locations in the body that um, express POMC, but if they're not also expressing the other, um, the other proteins needed to uh, transform POMC into its final form, then you're not going, it's not going to have the same effect as the tissues that have both the POMC expression and the, uh, the, uh, how to phrase that, the processing of the peptides into their final forms. So these tissues include the pituitary, the arculate nucleus of the hypothalamus, and the nucleus tractus solitaris, and the skin. Oh, I did not realize the skin had both produced POMC and the skin does both of those, really. So the skin is one of the tissues, apparently, that both expresses POMC and then also holds the, uh, the peptides in their cells as well. I didn't know that. However, the POMC gene has been reported to be widely expressed throughout the body, including the testis. So the POMC gene is expressed all over the body, but it's not always both expressed and processed in all the tissues, tissues of the body. So um, they're saying here it includes the testis, the ovary, placenta, spleen, lung, liver, thymus, thyroid, heart, kidney, lymphocytes, duodenum, and colon, and adrenal glands. So yeah, all over the body, right? Many of these studies were carried out using techniques such as northern blot and PCR and show expression. So uh, northern blot and uh, PCR, those are both uh, techniques of looking at the genetic material that is present within your sample. And so they would take samples throughout the entire, um, throughout an entire body. They would, I'd assume, blend it up, make some form of extract of it, and then use that extract to look for RNA. And I said genetic material, but it's uh, RNA is a type of genetic material as well. But uh, it's looking for the RNA that's because remember, each cell has its own DNA. But what is important for the expression, the production of the actual proteins is that they get transcribed into RNA first. So the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and it'll actually form many, uh, many copies of RNA. And so these many copies of RNA get turned into many more copies of protein through translation. So here, uh, with Northern Blot, we take our tissue samples and we extract, we extract the RNA from them, and then we run those RNAs through a gel, and with that gel, we are able to determine what types of uh, RNAs we have with further processing. So going back to here, many studies were carried out using techniques such as Northern Blot and PCR, and it shows the expression. So if you, if you are producing the RNA, then it's being expressed in that cell. But that doesn't 
tell you whether or not translation to protein or processing occurs in these locations. So remember, there is a diff you, you go from your DNA, DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and RNA gets translated into the final protein. So if you do these northern blots or these PCR assays, it tells you whether or not there is RNA, but that doesn't tell you if you have the protein, and it, uh, and it also doesn't tell you whether or not you have the, um, what's it called, the final post-translationally modified peptides. So in fact, it's been shown that many of these tissues contain a shorter mRNA transcript that would not be translated and therefore no peptide produced. So there would be um, there would be ways that you could um, theoretically get rid of the ability for RNA to be translated into the protein. And so they're saying here that in a lot of these other tissues, they have a shorter transcript. So there's probably a deletion somewhere which makes it more difficult for that RNA to be translated. Um, we Presumably, it could, it could be a regulatory mechanism or it could also be, um, it could be encoding for a completely different protein um, with its own function in the cell. We really don't, uh, as by the time this was written, we don't know if that's what's actually happening in these other tissues. Um, a, um, what would you call it? Some evolutionists or evolutionary theorists would very much argue that every everything you can find uh, has some role in the body um, or at least can confer some advantage because if it doesn't then they, those would very quickly be weeded out and removed however who knows if that's actually what's happening here so furthermore in both humans and murine models or mouse models lacking POMC there is no obvious phenotypes relating to these diverse tissues so that, okay, well, that an somewhat answers the first question. So what they're saying here is if you genetically engineer a mouse to not synthesize any POMC, we don't, they cannot recognize any difference in the characteristics of those exact, of those other tissues. Now here it doesn't say um, if they could see a difference in the important tissues, such as the pituitary, the hypothalamus, um, the skin, uh, they didn't say whether or not, here it's not saying whether or not those are changed, but for all of, for most of these other ones over here uh, that do not normally process the POMC, apparently there's not a big difference uh, in these tissues. That There's not a difference that they can recognize at least. There might actually be a difference, except... Um, it's hard, whatever techniques they've been using, it wasn't straight, they're not straightforward or they're not statistically significant. So, uh, therefore, even if active POMC peptides were made in these tissues, their functional significance would appear to be negligible. So it is possible that the POMC is being produced and processed and is affecting the cell, but it would be a negligible amount. So where we normally see the issues are in the, I shouldn't say normally, but we would see the effects in the important tissues that have a lot of protein processing. So the use of POMC, it Cree mouse line, <clears throat> excuse me. So Cree, the use of POMC Cree. So Cree is a, um, it's a, basically a tag, if I remember correctly. So let's look this up just to make sure. So you can add these two proteins. Wait, let me... I'm going to look this up. The Cree lock Scott. Okay, so you... that's right. This is of DNA, not of So that's 10 minutes. 
So the use the use of POMC Cree mouse line. So what is Cree? So Cree is a part of the Cree locks recombination, and it involves the targeting of a specific sequence of DNA and splicing it with the with the help of an enzyme called the Cree recombinase. So Cree recombinase is able to uh, attack the Cree sequence. So the Cree lox recombination is commonly used to circumvent embryonic lethality caused by systemic inactivation of many genes. So this would be a way that you could uh, genetically engineer something but only have the effects of that genetic engineering happen after development. That would be an important thing. So let's say you want to see what happens when you destroy a gene. Well, if you destroy a gene in a mouse, that mouse might not even be able to survive. So you might want the mouse to undergo its development fully and then remove the gene's effects. Anyway, as of February 2009, Crelox recombination is a powerful tool and is used in transgenic animal modeling to link genotypes and phenotypes. Anyways, the Crelox system is used as a genetic tool to control site-specific recombination events, and recombination is the exchange of genetic material between different organisms. Um, so it's a, it's a genetic tool to control site-specific recombination events in genomic DNA. So this system has allowed researchers to manipulate a variety of genetically modified organisms to control gene express expression, delete undesired DNA sequences, and modify chromosome architecture. So the Cree protein is a site-specific DNA recombinase that can catalyze the recombination of DNA between specific sites on a DNA molecule. These sites are known as the LOXP sequence. So this is where Cree LOX comes from. So it's a Cree protein, and it looks for these LOXP sequences. Anyways, uh, these contain specific binding sites for Cree that surround a directional core sequence where recombination can occur. So this is, let's get this image out. So I'm going to go through it. So, so here we have our LOX, and I believe this NNN, T-A-N-N-N, is the actual um, lock site. Oh, wait, no. Locks. Oh, yeah, these are. So, as you can see. Ooh, okay. Okay, this will be difficult for me to do, but here we have our. DNA. And this particular DNA is in a circle. So not all DNA is like that, but this particular one is. So uh, we would call it a plasmid, usually, depending on how large it is. So here we have our LOX71. Okay, so this is a type of LOX, and here is the sequence of the LOX71, and this is where Cree molecules can bind onto that LOX71. Okay? So, and then the same thing happens to this LOX66, which has a different sequence, but another sequence that LOX can, or that Cree can bind to as well. So what happens is, when the Crees are bound to both of these, and they're bound in this particular manner, so four proteins and two DNA strands, or two DNA molecules, or four strands, if you will, they all come together like this. And so, what happens is the Cree cuts the DNA and then arranges it in a way to cause the two DNA molecules to fuse. And this is how they are fusing. So, fusing like this, and then in the very end, so in the very end, this is the output, where you have both the LOX71-66 and the LOX-P. So, yeah, 
Okay, I think that's all we need to go over. But just so you know, this is a way to insert uh, usually plasmids into a larger DNA sequence, at least in the case of mice. So, with that out of the way, the use of the POMC Cree mouse line expressing a fluorescent protein has further confused our understanding of the expression patterns of POMC, especially in the brain regions. So POMC is widely expressed during development, but it becomes more restricted in adulthood. However, the POMC, the POMC Cree manipulation will allow fluorescent protein to continue to be expressed into adulthood. Even if POMC was only expressed in that particular region during a developmental period. So in this particular case, the POMC, the POMC cream manipulation will allow the fluorescent protein to continue to be expressed into adulthood. So even if POMC was only expressed in that particular region. So this was first highlighted in the articulate, in the articulate nucleus of the hypothalamus, where a gouty related peptide, also known as agarp, neuropeptide Y and POMC neurons are mutually exclusive in adulthood. So um, there, in adulthood, you don't see cells that produce both POMC and neuropeptide Y. That just doesn't, doesn't happen to any noticeable degree. However, the uh, the AGRP slash neuropeptide Y neurons express the POMC Cree lineage into adulthood. So this is confounding what we would normally believe. Uh, what I guess uh, is determined based on, on the mRNA, so the PCR or the Northern Blot studies. Anyways, although they did not continue to, to express POMC at this time, so the same group carried out a further study using the palm Cree line examining other brain regions and found POMC recombination in regions including the hippocampus, regions of the cortex, and midbrain. So the same group looked for other, other places where POMC is being expressed where it normally isn't, and lo and behold, it is well into adulthood. So peripheral tissues have not been examined, but this same ectopic pattern may be true for POMC expression outside the brain. Furthermore, the use of POMC cream mouse line to excise genes in POMC expressing tissues may lead to spurious, spurious deletions in other regions where it may not be truly relevant. So expression of the POMC gene is only one facet of a complex mechanism which requires coordinate release of POMC protein and processing enzymes to generate a biologically relevant effect. So we have concentrated on the pituitary, the hypothalamus, and skin where there is, excuse me, evidence for all these processes and for the role of the peptides produced from these tissues. So here they're just describing the difficulty it is to even do studies on POMC. For one, when we use a um, a genetically engineered gene with the Cree, Cree in it. And I should also mention that Cree is sometimes used to deactivate a gene as well. So, um, yeah, what was I getting at? Yeah, let's, let's just continue. So POMC is cleaved by pro-hormone convertases at well-defined dibasic amino acid sequences. So these can be a combination of lysines, arginines, and histidines, but histidines would not uh, usually be uh, present because those are sometimes not positively charged. Anyways, uh, the type of pro-hormone convertases in a particular tissue defines the specific peptides produced. There is no doubt that the processing of pro-hormones is a very specific mechanism but why this is necessary has not been addressed in detail in this review. So in the anterior pituitary, POMC is initially cleaved between the uh, carbon terminal or the C-terminal or the COOH terminal of ACTH, adrenocorticotropin hormone, and the N-terminal of beta-lipotropin H. 
to yield pro-ACTH and beta-lipotropin. Beta-lipotropic hormone, I think. Ah, freak, I forgot what this was. This cleavage is carried out by pro-hormone convertases 1, uh, 1 over 3, so PC1 over 3, which cleaves at sites where there are dibasic amino acids. In this case, the cleavage is at the lysine arginine site at the carbon terminal of ACTH. There are other dibasic amino acid sequences in POMC indicating that, that any preference for cleavage at one site over another is most likely due to neighboring amino acids or the resultant three-dimensional structure allowing easier access to the active sites of the convertases. So this would be one way that you could have preferential cleavage at particular sites. So let's say the cell is only producing a particular type of uh, pro-hormone convertase. These POMC molecules, or these POMC proteins, have a specific shape to them. And the shape might or might not have these dibasic residues that are somewhat exposed. Now, some pro-protein convertases might be able to fit into that protein very well and cleave uh, that dibasic site, whereas a different pro-protein convertase might not be able to fit as easily. So this would be one way that cells can uh, specify which proteins or which peptides are being produced from the POMC. Um, anyways, the next stage in cleavage occurs between the carbon terminal of joining peptide and the N terminal of ACTH. This releases ACTH and an N terminal peptide, peptide containing uh, NPOMC, also called pro gamma melanocyte stimulating hormone. So, why we have 10 names for the same freaking hormone, don't ask me. Also, N joining, N joining peptide. The latter was discovered as the missing fragment in human POMC in 1981. The human joining peptide is amidated and secreted as a homodimer joined by alpha cysteine by an alpha cysteine bridge. So the human joining peptide, and let's look this up so that you have a visual as well. It's a small piece. Let's look up because uh, that makes it it's called cell penetrating peptide um. uh, this is not it I believe yeah, I don't know if I will actually be able to find one. It seems to be pretty rare. Anyways, let's look. Twenty five. Yeah, I must have a completely different name now. So that was at twenty four minutes. So this particular fragment is two small peptides that are actually the uh, how did I phrase that? So the palm C gets cleaved, and then there's one particular peptide that actually comes from two POMC molecules and they are actually bound together using a cysteine bond as well. So this is a disulfide linkage, uh, the same linkages that give your hair a lot of its strength and a lot of its uh, rigidity. So in humans, 
it is thought that there is relatively little further processing in the anterior, in an anterior pituitary. This would result in N-POMC joining peptide, ACTH, and beta lipotropin as the major POMC-derived peptides released from the anterior pituitary. So A, the generation of the MSH peptides. In the hypothalamus, and these are melanocyte-stimulating hormone. So in the hypothalamus and pars intermedia of the anterior lobe of the pituitary, and this is present in rodents and human fetal pituitaries, but it's rudimentary in adult humans, so it apparently uh, degenerates over time, uh, there is much more extensive processing of the POMC. Again, the degree of processing is determined by which enzymes are expressed in the different tissue. So generation of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone from ACTH. So generation of alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone initially involves cleavage of ACTH by PC2, and this is a one of the prohormone convertases. So prohormone convertase 2 to give ACTH 1 to 17, so the amino acid 1 to amino acid 17, and corticotropin-like intermediate lobe pept peptide, and this is called CLIP. And this is represents ACTH amino acids 18 to 39. So ACTH gets split into this 17 amino acids, and this one is split into its, what, 20, 21 amino acids for 22. 17 minus 1 plus 1, 17, 39 minus 18. Yeah. Anyways, to generate alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone from ACTH 1 through 17, the carbon terminal amino acids are removed in a stepwise fashion by carboxypeptidase E. So this is just another uh, peptidase. Disruption to the activity of this enzyme has major consequences for processing. And this is described in a later section. So ACTH 1 to 13 is then amidated at the carboxy terminal by peptidoglycine alpha amidating monooxygenase, or PAM. And this is to give ACTH um, amidated ACTH1. So this is this is a protein or a peptide that takes an amino group and adds it to the carboxy terminal of whatever amino acid sequence. So remember, the amino acids will have a carboxy terminal end, and it will have, I should say, peptides have a carboxy terminal end, and they have an N-terminal uh, amino end as well. And so what you can do is that carboxylic acid, you can process it to make uh, carboxylamid. So that is what they mean by this processing to give ACTH 1 to 13 NH2. And this is also known as desacetyl alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. So this is then acetylated at the NH2 terminal by acetyl transferase um, to give alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone. The main effect of the NH2 terminal acetylation is not obvious, as some functions are increased and others are blocked by this process. So for instance, alpha, and remember, the C-terminal got an amino group added to it. However, the N-terminal will get an acetyl group added to it. So it's acetate that's like vinegar. So it's another way to process amino groups. Uh, the main effect of the NH2 terminal acetylation is not obvious, and uh, for instance, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is more potent in modulating pigmentation, memory, and attraction, whereas the deacetylated, or the one without the one without the acetylation, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone is more effective in blocking opiate analgesia. Interesting. So. Alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone actually can, um, if it's in the deacetylated form, has the ability to um, block opiate analgesia. Analgesia. I never learned how to pronounce analgesia correctly. Uh, continuing, uh, generation of beta melanocyte stimulating hor 
hormone and beta endorphin from beta lipo lipotropic hormone or lipotropin LPH. Anyways, beta LPH is processed initially by cleavage at the amino acids between the carboxy terminal of gamma lipotropin and NH2 terminal and the N terminal of beta endorphin. The gamma lipotropin can then be processed at the lysine lysine site, so this is the dibasic site, to release beta melanocyte stimulating hormone from its C terminal. This L L site is, or I should say this KK site is present in the human POMC sequence, but not in that of rats or mice, and therefore it is thought that beta melanocyte stimulating hormone does not exist as a separate peptide in rodents. Interesting. So the sequence of beta endorphin is the 31 amino acids at the carboxy terminal of POMC. The, and remember, beta endorphin makes you feel good. It works on your opioid receptors. Uh, the sequence of beta endorphin is the 31 amino acids at the C terminal of POMC. The initial processing of POMC may only yield beta, beta LPH. However, cleavage can continue to give beta endorphin within the secretory granules. Uh, secret wait, the initial processing of the secret. The sequence of beta endorphin is the 31 amino acids at the C terminal of POM C. That doesn't sound right. The initial, I think that that might not be correct. Um, we'll we'll keep on going. I might have that might need to be clarified. So the initial processing of POM C may only yield beta lipotropin. However. Cleavage can continue to give beta endorphin within the secretory granules before release from some pituitary and corticotropic cells. I think I think they meant to say. The sequence of beta endorphin is the 31 amino acids at the C terminal of beta lipotropin. So let's go back to Oh, geez. Yeah, that, that's right. So it goes from N to C. That's at the very end of POM C. Gosh, my bad. Yeah, they, they were correct in what they said. So the sequence of beta endorphin is the 31 amino acids at the C terminal of POM C, so the C end of POM C. The initial processing of POM C may only yield beta lipotropin or B or beta LPH. However, cleavage can continue to give beta endorphin within the secretory granules before release from some pituitary corticotropic cells. Uh, several studies have shown that in addition to beta endorphin, some further processing can give beta endorphin 1 through 27 and beta endorphin 1 through 26, which are also present in the pituitary and brain. So are these waste products or do they have their own function? Probably have their own function. So generation of gamma MSH from n -POM C. The N-terminal region of POMC contains the sequence for the third melanocortin peptide gamma melanocyte stimulating hormone. So pro-gamma MSH is often called n -POM C or NPOC um, in the human n -POM C sequence, there is a pair of dibasic amino acids at 49 to 50, um, which would enable enzymatic cleavage to POM C 1 to 49, and Y sub 3 MSH, also known as lysine gamma 3 MSH, which has 27 amino acids. 
uh, from this from the gene sequence, gamma sub 3 MSH was not expected to include the first lysine, but the cleavage takes place at the C terminal side of the arginine residue, leaving lysine as the first amino acid in gamma sub 3 MSH. As it is an extension of the predicted sequence, it sometimes includes it's sometimes included in the nomenclature. So further processing occurs to occurs to produce the gamma sub 2 MSH sequence, which is a dodecapeptide, and then and then this can be cleaved into the 11 amino acid gamma sub 1 MSH. However, this processing can be restricted by glycosylation, and glycosylation is the addition of sugars at uh, asparaginine in gamma 3 gamma sub 3 melanocyte stimulating hormone. So uh, species differences in POMC processing. So many of the melanocortin peptides are conserved among mammalian species, although there are some exceptions which have consequences for physiology. Neither rats nor mice are able to produce beta MSH as they lack the dibasic residues required for cleavage at the N-terminal uh, region. For guinea pigs, there is speculation that they may also have a shorter version of beta MSH as they have two sets of dibasic residues in the uh, C terminal region, which could potentially give rise to two variations of beta melanocyte stimulating hormone. So this would be a very effective way to uh, easily mutate new hormones is you uh, can relatively easily mutate these dibasic residues uh, in different areas and uh, you could either completely remove a peptide or add a new peptide just by mutating in dibasic cleavage sites. So in mouse, rat, and guinea pig, gamma sub 1 or gamma sub 2 MSH may not exist because the C-terminal region does not have the dibasic amino acids to allow cleavage. This would suggest that rodents only have the extended gamma sub 3 MSH peptide, whereas the human POMC sequence uh, the gamma sub 1 MSH peptide has a flanking dibasic amino acid, dim flanking dibasic amino acids, and therefore the potential for cleavage. So, processing enzymes that generate POM C peptides. So, the very specific processing pathway for peptide hormones enables enzymatic cleavage of the precursors in a defined environment. While a lot is known about the pro-hormone convertases and the cleavage of pro-insulin, many of the mechanisms involving these cleavage processes were identified by studying the processing of POMC. In addition, there are a number of other enzymatic modifications that occur in the processing pathways to prepare the hormones for their roles. So, A, one of them, the pro-hormone convertases. So, the PCs are a family of serine proteases of the subtilis, subtilisin kexin type. And although PC1 and 3 and PC2 are the most important for POMC processing, studies on PC4, PACE4, PC5, 6, PC7, um, S1P and SKI1 and PSEK9, all of these have informed our knowledge of the mechanism of pro-protein processing. Much of the early work in the convertases has been reviewed by Bergeson and others, uh, Saida and Shretin, I, I apologize, I will continue. So the subtilisin endoproteases are highly, oh uh, wait, let me, let me just be ex very explicit here. So this family, um, the subtilisin kexin type, hmm, let's look this. Okay, let's keep on going. So, uh, much of the early work on the convertases have been reviewed by 
these people. So the subtilis and endoproteases, and endo means within the protein, um, they are highly homologous to human furin. Okay, this is what I was look at, going to look up. So furin is a molecule that, that cleaves at the polybasic cleavage sites, just so that we are all aware. So these proteases are calcium dependent and cleave at single or dibasic amino acids. Um, the cleavage occurs at the C terminal of the pair of dibasic amino acids. So in POM C, the lysine arginine site at the C terminal of ACTH is cleaved first and then at the lysine arginine at the N terminal of ACTH. The lysine, lysine arginine arginine site within or in ACTH which is cleaved to give ACTH 1 to 17 in the processing to alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, this site is not cleaved in the human anterior pituitary corticotropes. This provides evidence that the adjacent amino acids influence the, abil the ability of the PCs to identify the cleavage sites. So these types of cleavage sites are found in most peptide hormones and neuropeptides. It is thought that the arginine lysine and the lysine lysine sites are cleaved very slowly over days and that this cleavage occurs only in melanotropes and not in the corticotropes. So PC13 and PC2, how they got their names. So although POMC was identified as a precursor of ACTH and beta lipotropin in 1977, it took 15 years to discover the enzymes that cleave the peptides from POMC. It was identification of the yeast protease KEX2 that led to the breakthrough. The KEX2, like subtilicins, have similar catalytic mechanisms to trypsin-like proteases. Uh, this led to the identification of human insuloma C DNA encoding a pro-hormone convertase subsequently named PC2. At about the same time, a second group published the sequence of a mouse pro-hormone convertase, which they referred to as PC1. Uh, Smeekins and Steiner then isolated cDNA from the human insulinoma, insulinoma encoding a similar convertase, which they named PC3. This turned out to be identical to PT PC1, such that the nomenclature is now PC1-3. We just have to confuse things, right? So active prohormone convertases are cleaved from inactive precursors. All pro all pro-hormone convertases are themselves derived from precursors and are trafficked to the secretory granules where POMC processing occurs. The maturation of PC1-3 from its precursor, uh, precursor is described by uh, these people. PC1-3 has a signal peptide and an 80 to 90 amino acid pro-segment at the end terminal. This Pro-segment is thought to act as an intramolecular chaperone and a, com and a competitive inhibitor of the active site of the enzyme. So this signal peptide will possibly bind to the, um, the active location or the active site of the pro-hormone convertase. Uh, in the ER, the, inhibit, the inhibitory prosegment is removed by an autocatalytic process. So somehow the, well, not somehow, the, it is able, the protein is able to cleave its own self to turn itself into the active form. A similar mechanism occurs in PC13. The precursor protein seems to act as a competitive inhibitor at the uh, active site of the processed PC. In particular, pro-PC13 is expressed in its trans conformation uh, is able to act as an inhibitor of PC13. So this not only not only can it inhibit its own self, but it could emit the pro version can inhibit others, others of it that are like itself. The pro segment of PCs may have inhi inhibitory actions that are distinct for each PC as they are different in each PC precursor. So, um, yeah. After the prosegment of PC13 is proteolytically removed, which takes several minutes, the resulting 84 kilodalton pro-hormone convertase moves to the uh, TGN and then to the immature secretory granules, or ISGs, 
where a C-terminal inhibitory peptide is removed. So this leaves a 66 kilodalton form, which is much more active than the 84 kilodalton form. This C-terminal peptide has to be cleaved by PC13 in the ISGs, or the uh, immature secretory granules, to stop its inhibitory action at the catalytic domain so that the mature 66 kilodalton form is fully active to cleave its target peptides. Uh, this suggests that the post-translational processing of PCs is regulated, regulated very precisely. You don't want these PCs to be uh, running amok, so you need to control them. Uh, too much active PC13 in the ER would generate the fully active form, but without some autocatalytic activity, the in inhibitory forms would not be removed. The C-terminal domain is also important for directing PC13 into secretory granules. Without this, the 66 KDA form would move to the constitutive pathway. And so, um, yeah, I think I will stop here because I think this is a good place to stop. So thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.